In fact, we're going to start talking about vapor pressure. So maybe I should have called this vapor pressure and boiling point. But who cares? It's all in the title, right? Vapor pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by a liquid in equilibrium with its pure liquid phase at a given temperature. We actually have talked about vapor pressure a little bit when we did our gas experiment. We had to worry about the water vapor that had uh, formed inside the flask turned upside down when we collected the butane in that flask. So there was water vapor present because water evaporates at all temperatures and the gaseous particles that come out of that is referred to as water's vapor pressure. In a closed container, such as we had in that gas experiment with the butane, the liquid particles evaporate at the same rate that gaseous particles are condensing. The vapor pressure of a liquid is dependent only upon the nature of the liquid and the temperature. So it only depends on what the liquid is and its temperature. It doesn't depend on how much there is or how large or how small the opening is. It only depends on two things, what the liquid is. Is it water? Is it acetone? Is it uh, an alcohol of some type? And it only depends on the temperature. And the reason that it only depends on the nature of the substance, what the substance is, is because some things are more um, evaporative than other things. And it has to do with their intermolecular forces. Water ha has pretty low vapor, vapor um, pressure at normal temperature because it doesn't evaporate so quickly. Um, and the reason it doesn't evaporate so quickly is because it has very strong intermolecular forces. Remember, those are the dipole-dipole forces with hydrogen bonding. Something like acetone, which only has dipole-dipole forces, is a liquid at room temperature, but it evaporates very easily. We said that it is volatile, and um, that's because its intermolecular forces are pretty weak, especially compared to something like water. Different liquids at any temperature have different vapor pressures because of their polarities. And the vapor pressure of every liquid increases as the temperature is raised. As we increase the temperature, we're putting more energy into those liquid particles, and they are able to overcome those attractive forces that are holding them in the liquid state. When a particle can overcome its attractive forces in the liquid state, it is more uh, likely to leave the liquid state and become a gas. OK. Um, so I found this simulation that actually I can control, and, and uh, we're going to take a picture of But what you see here, and I'm going to start it playing, what you see here are water molecules. Blue is oxygen, red is hydrogen. They are in the solid phase, you can tell, because the temperature is 102 Kelvin, located at the top of the screen. And uh, this is what solid water molecules look like. Every now and then you might see one water molecule kind of uh, want to try to escape. Maybe if I add just a tad bit of heat, let's see what happens. 176 Kelvin, so we're about a negative 100 degrees Celsius. That's pretty cold. Those water molecules are moving pretty good. Note, watch up here, they're trying to escape. They just can't let go. Those intermolecular forces are pretty strong. Let's see what happens when we take it to the liquid state. Here we have 292 Kelvin. And most of the particles are stuck together, but you'll notice a few of them seem to be kind of bouncing around all by themselves. Oh, and then they stick together, and because of those hydrogen bonds. Uh, but every now and then they gain just enough energy to escape the liquid phase. Uh, you kind of think of it as, as um, the, the water particles that are on the edge and on the surface of the water can sometimes gain enough energy to escape and evaporate. Um, and you see the two in the upper right kind of fighting to kind of stick together and then I'm falling back down and becoming part of the liquid again. But notice right in the middle, if you kind of stick to maybe one of these water molecules that's right in the middle, it's not ever going to evaporate until it gets to the edge. That water molecules can only evaporate if they're on the surface of the liquid. Well, here they are all zipping around. Occasionally two molecules will stick, two or three, maybe four, will kind of stick together and form those hydrogen bonds. But that, if that happens, it, it stays that way for just a little while, and then, and then they kind of let go of each other. Gas particles are notorious for uh, just simply um, uh, acting independently and on their own. All right, let's go and see what happens if we start looking at phase changes. So I've got water again. It's at 102 Kelvin. Um, if I add a little bit of heat to this at 102 Kelvin, let's see what happens. You can see that they're in the solid phase. And they're all just kind of wiggling and really sticking together. I'm just going to add heat slowly to this because I want to kind of liquefy this. Uh, I'd have to get up to 273 Kelvin because 273 Kelvin is going to be 100, uh, uh, 0 degrees Celsius. And there goes one it escaped, but it's, watch it come back down. Boom, it's stuck in the middle again. We're getting closer to the boiling point of water, 240 Kelvin. 
I'm sorry, I said boiling point, but I meant uh, melting point. You still have that ice, it's still warming up. Particles are starting to kind of escape a little bit and, and actually leave the solid state and go straight into the gaseous state. Um, now we're at 262 Kelvin, so slightly above. Um, now here we go, liquid phase, 276 Kelvin, which is like three or four degrees Celsius. You kind of start to see them. We take them up to, ooh, let's see if we can get them at room temperature. I have to kind of, whoop. there we are, room temperature, 293 Kelvin. Uh, about 20 degrees Celsius, maybe just a little bit more heat. Uh, let's see what happens. 300 Kelvin, so that's about 27 uh, degrees Celsius. And you see water molecules are moving around very good. And you see uh, quite a number of them have evaporated and kind of left their container. Look at the pressure. Uh, because they're evaporating, they're exerting some type of vapor pressure. So this pressure sensor is measuring uh, the vapor pressure of the particles. It's pretty low. Um, and that's what you would expect from slightly higher than room temperature uh, water. Well, let's crank this heat up a little bit and see what happens. Okay, now that was water particles are going to start to evaporate. You see more of them uh, forming into the vapor. Um, and as we get close to 373 uh, Kelvin, which would be 100 degrees Celsius, um, we're going to see the pressure is changing, although it's running up and down. It kind of depends on how many particles there. But we would actually hit the boiling point. Don't you like my heat here? This is pretty neat. Um, and now we're at, you know, the thermometer is going to blow its stack there. Uh, we're at 800, almost 900 Kelvin, so that's pretty hot. And now, really, we have no liquid water molecules as we, as we did before. Vaporization or evaporation occurs at all temperatures, and it's important to remember that because one of the things we're working towards is a definition of uh, boiling point. You see, early in the year, I defined boiling point as the temperature at which a, a liquid... Uh, turns into a gas, and that's not really true. Uh, we could say the same thing about evaporation, that the, uh, evaporation is when a liquid turns into a gas. Well, how is evaporation different from boiling? And many students in the past have said, well, you've got to heat it to be boiling, and that's not really true. Um, in class one day, I'm going to boil some water for you, and I'm not going to heat it. In fact, I will touch boiling water, and I will not get hurt. I'll let you touch it, and you won't get hurt. Amazing, amazing stuff we can do in this class. Aren't you just excited? But evaporation occurs at all temperatures. Boiling point, as we're going to see in a minute, only occurs at one specific temperature. I'm not quite ready for that yet. Here's an image of water particles that are evaporating. These particles down here are in the liquid state. So I'll put a big L there. And these particles up in here are in the gaseous state. And they've just achieved enough energy to escape um, the liquid phase and, and moved in, move into the gaseous phase. Um, if this container is closed, what we'll see is some of these particles condensing and some of these particles evaporating kind of at the same rate. That would be in a closed container. We call that equilibrium. But if it's an open container, we'll just eventually see all these particles that are in liquid state rise, and most of them will just go ahead and leave the container. So let's work a little problem here. This is in your book, page 501. Predict which substance in each of the following pairs will show the largest vapor pressure at a given temperature. Okay, first of all, let's make sure we understand what we mean by largest vapor pressure. Something that has a large vapor pressure is, means it will evaporate easily. It means that the intermolecular forces holding these particles together in the liquid state is pretty weak. I'll say that again, or you can hit rewind. Having the largest vapor pressure means that it has weak intermolecular forces because the particles easily evaporate that doesn't require much energy for them to evaporate. I think the easiest way to answer this question is to draw Lewis structures and to think about the um, polarities of the molecules. Okay, so let's do that. Water you should know pretty handily. Like this. Water has a dipole moment here and a dipole moment here. In fact, water can have hydrogen bonding because it's got an H bonded to an O. In fact, we've got two of those cases where if we have another water molecule, we get this kind of hydrogen bonding forming in there and another water molecule. So we get lots of hydrogen bonding happening in here because of these um, dipole moments there. If we draw the Lewis structure for methanol, CH3OH, we get carbon with three hydrogens on it. And then an oxygen 
bonded to a hydrogen. Okay, so we get a a little bit of a dipole moment here, and because there's a hydrogen connected to an oxygen, we do get some hydrogen bonding. So let's see if I can kind of draw that. There's another, but it's not quite as strong. Here's that hydrogen bonding right in. Oops, right in there. But it's not quite as strong as water because there's only one hydrogen bond per uh, interacting pairs. Put a big circle around that. Whereas in one water molecule, it's able to make two hydrogen bonds with other molecules. So we find that the largest vapor pressure occurs with the weaker intermolecular forces. And so for this problem, that's going to be the alcohol, the methanol. Okay, we know this. If I take out a bottle of methanol and a bottle of water and I drop, put a few drops on the counter, that the methanol will evaporate more. In fact, we'll do that in class one day. It'd be a good demonstration. Let's look at part B. What about methanol, which we just drew a second ago, so I'll draw it again. And one, two, there's one, two, three, four. So that's four means butte. So this is butanol, which would look something like this. CH3, CH2, 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 O. H. Very similar in structure, except this is one carbon chain, and this is a four carbon chain. Okay. Because this is larger, not only is it going to have hydrogen bonding, which can occur between this part and another OH, off to the carbons, I'm gonna, et cetera, et cetera. And we get the hydrogen bonding as we saw before. Except that's only going to one carbon. So you get the same number of kind of hydrogen bondings form or hydrogen bonds forming. Um, but because this butanol, the the four carbons, is bigger, it has larger or more London dispersion forces and therefore has um, stronger intermolecular forces and therefore lower vapor pressure. So that means that the answer to this question, which has the greatest vapor pressure, would be the smaller of the molecules, which would be the methanol. OK, you're going to get to practice with that for some homework. All right, how about boiling point? And we're going to talk about boiling point and its relationship to altitude. Not attitude, altitude. First of all, let's define boiling point because we need a new definition of boiling point, which I mentioned before. We've talked about evaporation when a liquid goes to a gas. We early in the year said a, that boiling point occurs when a liquid goes to, or boiling is when a liquid goes to a gas. And yet those terms are different. Um, they, they, they mean different things slightly. So we actually need two different definitions, not the same definition, uh, since they mean different things. So what is boiling point? The normal boiling point of any pure substance is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that substance is equal to one atmosphere of pressure. We call that the normal boiling point. So water's normal boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius because that's when the vapor pressure, the pressure exerted by the water particles as they have evaporated, is equal to one atmosphere. So boiling point, our best definition from boiling point then, is the temperature at which atmospheric pressure equals vapor pressure. And one of the ways I can get water to boil at room temperature is to lower the atmospheric pressure of the water uh, in a container. And I will do that for you um, in a classroom because it's kind of cool, <laughs> literally. Well, let's, let's take this idea to a whole, a whole nother step, a whole nother place. Here's a map of various places on the Earth. The squiggly lines mean ocean water. So let's talk about Atlanta. If you recall, Atlanta is a thousand feet above sea level, roughly, in some places. Okay, at a thousand feet, atmospheric pressure is less than one atm. 
normal atmospheric pressure in Atlanta is slightly less than one atmosphere. Slightly less than one atmosphere. You recall we talked about how as you go higher and higher in altitude, there becomes less and less air because air is affected by gravity. It is pulled down. So as we go higher and higher in altitude, there is less air, and so vapor pressure is less. Atlanta is only about a thousand feet above sea level, so it's not that much less. Um, but what we find is that at sea level, boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius because that's where atmospheric pressure equals vapor pressure. Since atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure in Atlanta is a little bit lower, we actually find that the boiling point here is about 99 degrees Celsius. Not much of a difference. You're not going to notice that um, on our thermometers because they're not expertly calibrated to four or five uh, significant figures. Um, but uh, we find that the boiling point in Atlanta is about 99 degrees Celsius. So when I tell you to go boil water, and you say, Mr. Carrington, it's not at 100 degrees Celsius, but yet it's bubbling. What's going on? I'll say, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. I mean, the reason is because I know that we're not quite at, at uh, sea level. So the boiling point of water in Atlanta is a little bit less, but it's not a big difference. In Denver, which is at one mile above sea level, we actually find that the boiling point of water is closer to 95 degrees Celsius. Man, imagine how messed up those kids are out there when they've always been told that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, and then they go to their classroom, and they measure it, and it's boiling, and it's 95 degrees Celsius. Wow, poor kids. You've got it so easy. But that's also why sometimes you see written on um, boxes of food that you have to prepare and cook and cook in boiling water, you will sometimes see... Um, instructions for cooking or making food at higher altitudes because the instructions are going to be a little bit different because of the, the temperature at which water boils at. Since it boils at a lower temperature, you have to cook it a little bit longer. At Mount Everest, where the altitude is about 29,000 feet or so, we find that the boiling point, get this, the boiling point is 69 degrees Celsius for water. Can you imagine that? So that's pretty low. I mean, that's hot water. It'd be a hot bath. But that's not near as high as the actual boiling point of water. Now in the Dead Sea, where the depth is somewhere around, it kind of depends on the sources, I looked at several different places, about 400 meters below sea level, um, kind of depending on where you are, um, we find that the boiling point here is something around 102 degrees Celsius, at least that's the calculations that I could find. So. Um, Boiling point of water changes with altitude. The higher up you go in altitude, where there's less air, so atmospheric pressure is lower, the boiling point is lower. And as you go below sea level, which doesn't really happen very often because there aren't too many places like that, the boiling point is slightly greater than sea level.